The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. Grab your sword and mount up, because Assignment Discovery is about to slice through the Age of Kings in The Feudal System, Castles at War. First, we'll witness how the fall of the Roman Empire led to chaos and the creation of a new social structure in the rise of feudalism. Then we'll explore the cold, haunted halls of some of the United Kingdom's most famous strongholds in Secrets of Britain's Castles. Next, we'll watch as popes, kings, and disease transform a continent in medieval and renaissance Europe. Finally, we'll forge through the Middle Ages and rediscover the beauty of Roman and Greek culture in early modern Europe. Kings, Castles, and Camelot, coming up next. As you watch the first half of this program, keep these questions in mind. In what ways could medieval kings lose their power? How does the legend of King Arthur differ from the reality of life during the feudal age? Life in Western Europe during the Middle Ages was a constant struggle, and usually short. Most people relied on kings and local lords for protection, and had few opportunities to make their lives better. What opportunities do you have to make your life better? There's more opportunities now to express your ideas because of our uh, democracy. I'm able to get a good education here. We're not all farmers now, where we used to be like alone and make our own land and just care for our own family now we can like we expand to different jobs we don't have to like work the land or whatever because we have um, machines to do a lot of that stuff for us and we just have to operate the machines I don't really have to clean up around my house as much as a lot of like kids would have done in the past now I get to work with like computers and have a lot more freedom to express my feelings compared to back then when you could only write The Middle Ages began when the Western Roman Empire fell in the 5th century. This period lasted for hundreds of years. Without the Romans to provide protection, medieval Europe became a violent and dangerous place. Frequent foreign invasions by Vikings, Magyars, Muslims and other raiders weakened European rulers so that they could not maintain law and order. Seizing the opportunity, wealthy nobles seeking to expand their power and land holdings began fighting one another for territory. Out of this chaos emerged a new political and social system called feudalism. Because European kings weren't strong enough to control the battling nobles who were challenging their power, they struck a deal with them instead. In a formal ceremony, a monarch would give a noble a fief or grant of land. The monarch also promised to protect the noble. In exchange, the noble swore an oath of loyalty, vowing to be faithful to his lord, the monarch, and to supply him with armed warriors and other services. Through this feudal contract, the noble became the vassal of a king or queen. The monarch's vassals became lords themselves by subdividing their fiefs and acquiring vassals of their own. Like their overlords, these lesser nobles had to publicly promise their loyalty and support in return for land and protection. Often, the same man was both lord and vassal. 
lord to a less powerful noble below him, and vassal to a more powerful noble above him. Feudal society had a strict social order. The monarch was at the top. Directly below him were the upper nobility. Even though they were below the king, it was these local lords who controlled most people's lives. The social hierarchy continued down through the rest of society. Just under the nobility were the knights, mounted warriors who did battle for their lords. Nobles also sometimes hired men-at-arms, soldiers who had the same equipment as knights, but not their social standing. The peasants were at the bottom of the social order. They were generally poor, uneducated laborers who lived and worked on the land owned by the nobles. The peasants were the economic backbone of society, growing the crops and producing the other goods that everyone needed. The peasants were considered part of the land they lived on. When a noble received a fief of land, he received the peasants who lived on it too. Peasants couldn't leave the land without the Lord's permission, and they had to obey the Lord's laws. They also had to work for the Lord, farming his lands and giving him regular payments of what they produced. In return, the peasants were allowed to farm some of the Lord's land for themselves. Perhaps more important during this chaotic period, they enjoyed the stability and protection of the Lord's laws and his armies. These were big benefits during the Middle Ages, when competing lords, bandits, and raiders from outside Europe were a serious threat. A main source of protection during the Middle Ages was a castle. An army that was barricaded inside a castle was incredibly difficult to defeat. And nobles, safe inside their castles, were able to build up their armies and expand their power. But the castles were more than just strongholds for the nobility. They also protected the entire community. During times of trouble, the local peasants gathered for safety inside the castle walls and often helped to defend the castle. Under feudalism, the overlords, lesser lords, knights and peasants all depended on one another for survival. Life may not have been easy for most people, but feudalism turned chaos into order and offered stability during a violent and uncertain age. Did you know? The word feudalism comes from the Latin word for fief, which is related to the Germanic word for cow. When nobles received fiefs from the king, the peasants as well as livestock on the land were included in the deal. Medieval Britain was littered with castles and kings. With the crown came betrayals, battles, and bedlam. The walls of these castles still stand, and they hold many stories of the kings and knights who walked their halls. What are the modern equivalents of kings, knights, and castles? King, probably just any leader of a country. President Bush. Teachers. My parents, because they rule your life. The knight is like the modern-day military personnel. Police officer or a CIA agent or a FBI <laughs> person. The government just kind of control everything, keep everything in line. The Pentagon is like a castle. I guess you could call the White House the King's Castle. Britain's castles. History, myth, and legend. Join us on a fascinating journey through some of the oldest and most famous buildings in the world. Meet William Wallace, the great Scottish patriot known as Braveheart. Which castle was the site of an attempted flight 500 years ago? And who was the servant in charge of a king's other throne? Stand by for tales of exhilarating escapes, barbaric battles, monstrous murders, and tales of jousts, chivalry, and romance. The castles that have dominated Britain's landscape for centuries now yield their secrets of the brave, the beautiful, and the bizarre.
Scotland, for much of its history, a war-torn nation. Today, it's peaceful, but its countryside bears testament to past conflicts. Stirling Castle in central Scotland has been the scene of many of them, but it is linked to one man above all others. The great Scottish hero, William Wallace, immortalized in the movie Braveheart, fought and defeated the English here. Stirling is one of Europe's mightiest castles, a symbol of the spirit of Scotland. On its high volcanic hill, it guarded major trade and military routes. It was said, who controls Stirling Castle controls Scotland. William Wallace, Braveheart in the Hollywood film, fought one of Scotland's greatest battles beneath the castle walls. Though Wallace is now world-renowned, little is known of his early life. But two things are certain. He was never called Braveheart, and he didn't look like Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson showed William Wallace as your stereotypical Scotsman as he's seen today. The kilt, the long hair, um, William Wallace was nothing like that. So what did he look like? He looked like this. This is William Wallace prepared for battle. Wallace led the struggle for Scottish independence from English rule. In 1297, determined to win back Stirling Castle from England's King Edward I, he fought the Battle of Stirling Bridge against an English army twice the size of his own. The film Braveheart made no mention of the river forth flowing beneath the castle or of the bridge across it. But both the river and the original wooden bridge were crucial to Wallace's military tactics. Wallace used the river to split the English army into two smaller forces. Wallace lay in wait as the enemy made a disastrous move. After half the English soldiers had crossed the bridge, he cut off the rest, leaving them stranded on the far side of the river. The English king's treasurer, the much-hated Hugh de Cressingham, ordered the English to cross the bridge to shorten the war and save money. He met a gruesome fate after being captured by the Scottish during the battle. The battle was a famous Scottish victory over the English. It made certain William Wallace is still remembered 700 years after his death. His name is so revered, a massive monument to his memory stands within sight of the castle walls. Here lies his statue. Stirling Castle has seen blood and gore, but also beauty. Within its ramparts is a Renaissance palace built by a Scottish king for his French queen. It also saw one of man's first attempts at flight. This unlikely episode dates back to 1507, in the reign of Scotland's King James IV. James hired a scientist, John Damien, to try to turn base metal into gold. He had no more success than anyone else who has tried it. John Damien was you know, a bit of a mad scientist. There would be lots of bangs and whizzes and things going on from his laboratories which would impress people to actually think that, that he was actually doing something. Having produced no gold, 
Damien tried another mad scheme to win the king's approval. He made a huge pair of wings using strips of wood, chicken feathers, and glue. In front of the king, the visiting French ambassador, and the entire Scottish court, Damien boasted he would fly from Stirling Castle to France. He climbed the castle walls and peered into the long drop. Then he bowed gracefully to the king and his court. He then stood on the wall and he jumped. Now for a moment he may have hung in the air like a bird of prey would hang, but then with the grace and dignity of a stone, he then flew straight vertically downward. Damien was no more successful at flight than he was at alchemy. But he had a stroke of luck. A soft landing in cesspit sewage at the foot of the castle walls. The only damage, a buckled wing, a broken leg, and hurt pride. He claimed he shouldn't have used chicken feathers, since chickens can't fly more than a few feet. With eagle feathers, he argued, he would have soared to France. John Damien's flight is one of the more bizarre chapters in Stirling Castle's history. But there were many a dark and infamous deed. One of the most villainous in 1452. The Scottish King James II had a red birthmark and was known as Fiery Face. He had a temper to match. Fearing for his throne, he invited his archenemy, the Earl of Douglas, to Stirling Castle for a peace conference. It was anything but. The king's terrible temper was to prove lethal. After eating together, the peace conference turned into a bloodbath. James stabbed the Earl and the King's followers joined in. The Earl's body with, with over 20 stab wounds was, uh, was then taken from the room, thrown out of a window where it landed in a garden down below. Even by the standards of the time, the King's conduct was widely condemned. The Earl's followers were outraged. They took their revenge by burning Sterling to the ground. But James of the fiery face had already left. Eight centuries of battles and violent deaths. Many people believe at least one of these deaths spawned a ghost that haunts the castle still. Many say they've seen or heard it. Gary Darcy, the castle's senior steward, was locking up the vaults one day when the lights failed and the staircase was plunged into darkness. I suspected it was somebody playing a trick on me, so I stood at the top of the staircase here and listened to hear for voices so I could find out who it was. I didn't hear any voices, but what I did hear was footsteps coming up the back of me. Now, having checked the tower, I knew that there was nobody down there. As the footsteps approached the back of me, I turned around and there was no one there. The hairs on, on the back of my neck stood up and it just felt, just, it just didn't feel right and it, it, I just had this, this sense and this urge just to, just to leave. centuries of history, of secrets, have stamped their mark on Stirling Castle, one of Britain's greatest fortresses. Hampton Court on the banks of the River Thames. This magnificent thousand-room Tudor Palace is just 10 miles from central London. Built nearly 500 years ago, it has witnessed great events of royal history you'll find the world's most famous maze here, first planted in 1690. But 150 years earlier, it was the favorite palace of England's best known king, Henry VIII, the monarch who married six times and beheaded two wives. 
His fifth wife was Catherine Howard. When they married in 1540, Catherine was perhaps only 15 years old. Henry was 49. Before long, Catherine was accused of taking lovers. Adultery by a queen was treason since it jeopardized the succession. Catherine was imprisoned in the palace, barred from seeing her husband. One day the young queen broke free of her guards and ran along the gallery to ask Henry for forgiveness. But she was quickly caught and dragged kicking and screaming back to her room. Catherine Howard was tried for treason. The verdict was certain. She made one last trip down the River Thames, passing under a bridge where the severed heads of her lovers were hanging. Catherine Howard, Queen of England, was beheaded at the Tower of London on the 5th of February, 1542. Since then, the gallery she ran down has been called the Haunted Gallery. People often complain in this gallery that they feel uh, rather cold, even in the height of summer. Uh, people have spoken of feeling a prod in the back, turn around, nobody there. And uh, several people have even fainted in this uh, gallery, or been alone in the, this gallery and heard a cry or a moan. And they do say that this is the uh, ghost of uh, Catherine Howard. Hampton Court has fabulous gardens. In the 1990s, the Privy Garden, reserved exclusively for kings and queens, was restored to its original splendor. Back in the 17th century, this land played a key role in the life of one of England's most famous kings. In 1642, civil war broke out in England. King Charles I was captured and brought to Hampton Court. But no one was quite sure how to treat a prisoner who was also a king. So Charles was given a suite of apartments, received visitors, hunted in nearby forests, and strolled in the gardens. The king became such a familiar figure in the gardens that one day he edged nearer to the river. And nearer. And nearer. Nobody noticed. On the Thames, a boat was waiting to take him to freedom. Charles I had made one of the easiest escapes in history. Over the years, kings and queens have remodeled Hampton Court in their own style. William III thought Henry's palace was outmoded. He built a whole new wing in the Baroque style. These days, visitors can walk up the spectacular King's staircase. At the top lies the guard room decorated with thousands of weapons. In William's time, this new set of royal apartments formed a succession of rooms designed to control access to the king. People clamored to see him, subjects petitioning for favors, others hoping closeness to their king would help them up the social ladder. As they walked through these apartments, less important subjects would be weeded out and turned away. Those who got as far as the privy chamber were allowed to meet the king. He would sometimes grant favors,
and sometimes not. But strangely enough, the favored and honored few who made it beyond the privy chamber enjoyed an amazing degree of intimacy with their sovereign. You could even beg for his favors at bedtime. You would watch his gentleman of the bedchamber undress him uh, in the evening and put him to bed, or if you came in the morning, you could watch him get out of bed and being dressed. One man shared the ultimate familiarity with the royal personage. Sir Henry Sidney, Earl of Romney, could petition the king at the most delicate of moments. Only he was allowed in this room, the most private of all. And for that, he earned £1,500 a year. It was a best paid job at court. Uh, his title was the Groom of the Stool. The Groom of the Stool. The man who waited on his master more than hand and foot. Edinburgh, the capital and most ancient city of Scotland, is also one of the most striking places in Europe. Perched high on a rock above this great city is Edinburgh Castle. This majestic landmark is steeped in mysteries. Its troubled story mirrors the history of Scotland itself. Filled with terrible deeds, sieges, enemy invasion, cruel power struggles, imprisonment, and murder. Countless lives have been lost fighting for this great prize, a symbol of Scottish pride. Edinburgh Castle is also the resting place of the honors of Scotland, the Scottish crown jewels. The history of these magnificent treasures is as turbulent as that of the castle. They've escaped war, invasion, and capture by the English. The crown, sword, and scepter were first used together at the coronation of the infant Mary, Queen of Scots, in 1543. Twenty-three years later, Mary, this enigmatic romantic figure, gave birth to her only child here. Mary lived a mile away at Holyrood, Edinburgh's royal palace. But six months into her pregnancy, something so dreadful happened, Mary decided her child must be born in Edinburgh Castle. One evening, Mary's husband, Lord Darnley, lurched drunkenly along the passageways of Holyrood. He and a group of armed noblemen burst into the room where Mary was dining with her secretary, David Rizzio. In a rage, Darnley accused Rizzio of fathering Mary's unborn child. They lunged forward and attacked him. Rizzio had grabbed at the Queen's skirts to try and avoid being pulled out. A pistol was pointed at the Queen's stomach, you know, obviously at the, at the child as well as herself. Um, and eventually they managed to prise Rizzio away. He was dragged screaming out of the supper room across the Queen's bedroom and, and uh, stabbed about 50, 60 times. Mary believed she and her unborn child were in mortal danger. The heir to the throne must be safeguarded. Edinburgh Castle was more secure than Holyrood. So for the birth, Mary swapped the sumptuous luxury of her palace for a humble room in the castle. Mary may well have chosen this tiny room as a secure venue for her confinement. It's on the outside of the castle, but in a way it's, it's inside because you've got to walk through quite a few rooms in order to get to it. So the, the possibility of our men marching in during the birth were at a minimum. On June 19, 1566, Mary gave birth to a healthy boy, James. The succession was assured and history made. For in 1603, Queen Elizabeth of England died without an heir. And James VI of Scotland inherited the English throne, becoming James I of England. Edinburgh Castle was not only built to keep people out, but also to keep them in. 
Its cold, dark dungeons have held common criminals, prisoners from the American War of Independence, and captured Frenchmen from the Napoleonic Wars. Other prisoners were luckier. 500 years ago, King James III of Scotland feared his brother, Alexander, Duke of Albany, was plotting to seize his crown. The king imprisoned the duke in the castle. He wouldn't have been imprisoned in the dark and dingy dungeons as part of the nobility. In fact, being brother of the monarch, he'd have been confined in the royal apartments here in Edinburgh Castle in relative comfort, if not luxurious surroundings, much similar to the room we're standing in here today. And the duke could buy luxuries. One day, he ordered two barrels of the best French wine. But instead of wine, one of the barrels contained a warning from his supporters and a route to safety. The Duke's life was now in danger from the King. That evening he planned a daring escape. He invited his guards to share his wine and serve them plenty. And then once they were drunk, he attacked them, killed them, he threw them in a huge oak fireplace where they fried in their metal breastplates. And as they were quietly cooking away, the smell of roasting beef throughout the castle, he got the rope out and threw it over the side to lower it down the castle wall. The Duke sent his page ahead down the rope. A wise move. All of a sudden, Alexander heard a muffled yell and the rope went limp. And he realised the rope was too short. So he pulled the rope up, attached a bed sheet to it, lengthening the rope, and then climbed down himself. At the bottom of the vast, steep walls of Edinburgh Castle, the Duke found his page, who had broken his leg. The Duke put him over his shoulder and carried him to freedom. Edinburgh Castle. This awesome stronghold is still the most powerful and majestic symbol of Scotland. At the southwest tip of Britain lies Cornwall's dramatic, jagged coastline. And here stand the ruins of Tintagel Castle. Thousands are drawn to Tintagel from across the world by a legend. Cornwall has probably inspired more myths and legends than any other part of Britain. But one stands out from the rest. The legend of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. The Arthurian tales are filled with romance, courage, loyalty, and the triumph of good over evil. They have inspired books, films, and musicals. They also inspired the building of a castle. Set on Cornwall's northern coast, Tintagel Castle was built on the spot where some believe Arthur's Camelot once stood. Merlin the Magician, the wizard and protector of Arthur, is said to have lived in a cave beneath Tintagel. Eight hundred years ago, Earl Richard of Cornwall, the brother of the King of England, was so enthralled by the legends he built his own castle on these barren, isolated shores. It was an impossible task for the builders. It's halfway down a slope. His master mason must have said, where? They must have gone to this trouble solely because the Earl of Cornwall wanted to be able to stand here and say, I am standing where Arthur, King of the Britons, stood. I am heir to the legend. And the legend tells of how Arthur came to be king. It was Merlin the wizard who planned and plotted Arthur's taking of the throne. 
they found a strange sight. There was a huge stone, and stuck in it was a sword. And written on the side of the stone were the words, Whoever can pull the sword from the stone is the true King of Britain. But no knight could draw the sword from the stone, until at last Arthur took his turn. Arthur took hold of the hilt and plucked the sword out as if it was coming out of butter. And at that Merlin appeared and said, kneel and swear allegiance to him. And so all the great knights and barons knelt and swore allegiance to Arthur. Thus he came on the throne. The Earl of Cornwall wanted to be seen as the upholder of Arthur's noble and chivalrous qualities. And as the inheritor of the great king's military might. In the legends, Arthur fought many battles. During one, the great sword of the stone was broken. And then Merlin said to Arthur, you need a new sword, come with me. And he took Arthur to a lake. And there as they looked, they saw in the center of the lake, a white arm come out of the water holding a magnificent sword. And Merlin said, that is yours, go and get it. Arthur got into a small boat and rowed out and plucked the sword from the hand and came back with it. The new sword was called Excalibur. And as long as Arthur wore its magical scabbard next to his body, he could never die in battle. Here at Tintagel is evidence of kings who lived on this headland centuries before even the Earl of Cornwall. These early kings of Western Britain created myths to reinforce their own power and glory. A carving in the rock at Tintagel hints that these myths became linked to the legends of Arthur. This is known as King Arthur's footprint. It may take us some way to bridge the gap between the legend and reality. Up and down the western seaboard of Britain, kings legitimized their rule by standing in the rock-cut footprints of their predecessors. The true successor of a line of kings stretching back into the past. With his warriors drawn up on the plateau in front of him, his foot in the sacred footprint of his forefathers, his ancestors buried on the skyline behind him, who could doubt this man's right to rule the land? Down the centuries, rulers at Tintagel used Arthur's legends to bolster their power. But the stories of Arthur have also enchanted and inspired millions of others. Tintagel Castle holds many, many secrets from that age of legend and magic. So many, it's impossible to know where truth ends and fiction begins. Arthur, Merlin, Excalibur. Whatever combination of reality and legend they are, each helped inspire the building of this new Camelot, Tintagel Castle. These great castles of Britain have seen so much in their rich and bloody history. The men and women who lived, loved, and conspired in them are long dead. But their fascinating stories live on in the magnificent castles they built. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. In what ways could medieval kings lose their power? How does the legend of King Arthur differ from the reality of life during the feudal age?
If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the second half of this program, keep these questions in mind. Did the shared goal of the Crusades unify the warring groups in Europe? How did medieval and renaissance philosophies differ? Medieval Europe was ravaged by war, but violence in Europe eventually turned toward the Middle East during the Crusades. Could opposing kingdoms of Europe unite for one cause, or would rivalries get in the way? What unites the students at your school? At our school, we're united by the honor code. Each of us is trusted by the teacher and trusted by everyone else. It's basically their common interest, I think. Activities unite students at my school, like if a lot of people are athletes in the same sport, they tend to hang out together, or if they're art people or musicians, they'll hang out together. Pretty much all of my friends, like 90% of my friends, are in my classes, so it really depends on the people in my classes that are kind of like outgoing and I can talk to. Once you hear everyone's ideas, you kind of mesh with people who have the same thoughts and beliefs as you. So that's what brings groups together. At around AD 500, Rome lost control of its territories. Land and power was up for grabs. The Middle Ages were underway. The early years of the Middle Ages were a terrifying time for most people. Violence became commonplace as waves of invaders swept across Europe. From the east came the Germanic peoples. From North Africa to the south came Arab Muslims. And from the north came the most feared invaders, the Vikings of Scandinavia. People turned to local nobles such as princes, dukes and counts for protection and to Christian institutions for hope. During Europe's Middle Ages, most people were peasants who worked the land. But the land was not theirs. It belonged to the nobles, who often lived in nearby manor houses. The nobles kept a large share of the peasants' harvest. In return, they allowed the peasants to keep some of the food they grew and offered protection from invaders and rival armies. The nobles built castles, enforced the laws, collected taxes, and defended the lands around them with hired soldiers. The most skilled of these soldiers were knights, who dedicated their lives to combat, a code of behavior called chivalry, and service to their lords. Over time, kings arose and began to build nation-states that they ruled with strong hands. Over time, the nobles recognized the authority of these kings. The other great authority in medieval Europe was the Roman Catholic Church. The popes exercised ultimate authority over the church, but the popes proclaimed that kings had a religious duty to obey them too. Sometimes the kings and the church clashed over issues of power. And often, rival kings battled each other. In 1095, Pope Urban II found a common enemy to unite Europe. Under the battle cry, God wills it, Urban II declared a religious war against the Muslim Turks who occupied the Holy Land in the Middle East. This region was home to Jerusalem, a city sacred to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. With Urban's campaign, it became the center of religious war. The Crusades had begun. Between 1096 and 1291, several waves of Christian knights and soldiers from Europe launched military expeditions to take the Holy Land from the Muslims. Thousands of Christians, Muslims and Jews died in the fighting. Innocent people, as well as soldiers, suffered horrible losses. Although they succeeded in capturing Jerusalem and other holy sites, the Crusaders could not hold on to them. 
In 1291, when the last Christian stronghold of Accra fell, the Crusades finally came to an end. Even though the fighting ended, the relationship between Europe and the Middle East continued. The Crusades had reopened trade between the Christian and Muslim worlds. Along with trade goods, Crusaders brought back new ideas, including advanced mathematics and astronomy, improved farming techniques, and new building methods. During the Crusades, life in Europe had slowly improved for many people. The population increased, trade improved, economies grew, and towns and cities revived. Grand cathedrals were built to express people's devotion to God, and Europe's first universities developed. But in the 1300s, Europe's long era of growth ended. The climate cooled and famine spread. The Hundred Years' War that raged between France and England from 1337 to 1453 devastated the French countryside. And a new invader entered Europe along the trade routes from the east, the Black Death. In fewer than 20 years, one-third of the people of Europe died from this flea-borne disease. As the Middle Ages came to a close around 1500, European society slowly began to recover once again, and a dramatic cultural rebirth that would become known as the Renaissance took root. Did you know? In 1212, the Children's Crusade began. French and German children fought to regain the Holy Land, hoping they would succeed where their elders had not. Unfortunately, they failed, and most lost their lives or were betrayed by unscrupulous adults. As the medieval era wound down, a new age blossomed. The rediscovery of the writings and art of ancient Greece and Rome began to transform European culture. The Renaissance had begun. Has any ancient wisdom ever helped you? One ancient wisdom that has helped me is um, um, humility is not a sign of weakness. I think the phrase carpe diem is a good phrase to live by because you should seize any opportunities that you can. As Confucius said, treat others as you would like to be treated. I think that's what he said. And I think that's an, an awesome way to live your life. The ancient wisdom that I learned was meditating and it helped me because it helped me deal with stress and with problems in life. Of course we build on everything that people have done before us. So just their way of like living their houses and farming and all their technology has helped us achieve what we have today. Europe's modern age can be traced back to the Renaissance. A time of remarkable cultural rebirth, the Renaissance took place in Europe between about 1350 and 1600. This movement began when the writings and art of the ancient Greeks and Romans were rediscovered. European scholars saw the time before the Renaissance, called the Middle Ages, as a dark and backward time. Medieval thinkers focused on religious issues such as theology, the study of religious faith, practice, and experience. But during the Renaissance, new learning inspired by the works of ancient Greeks and Romans led scholars to turn their focus from the heavens and God to the earth and humans. Renaissance thinkers promoted three ideas, humanism, individualism, and secularism. Humanism emphasized a return to the classical study of human capabilities. Individualism highlighted the accomplishments of the individual. The ideal became a person who showed talent in many different fields. Secularism changed the focus of life from a struggle to get to heaven to advancing one's position on earth. Italy was the birthplace of the Renaissance. Renaissance Italy was a collection of city-states run by nobles. It was also the home of rich merchants and bankers who were becoming powerful in Italian society. 
In Florence and other Italian cities, rich families like the Medici's displayed their wealth by giving money to artists and intellectuals. This led to an explosion of new art, science, architecture, literature, and ideas. Some of history's greatest artists and thinkers lived during the Renaissance, such as Leonardo da Vinci, who drew plans for modern machines centuries before they were invented. The ideas of the Renaissance spread north from Italy to the rest of Europe. Some Europeans applied this new learning to religious institutions. In Germany, Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation, a movement to reform the Catholic Church. Luther criticized the immorality and corruption he saw in the church and wanted people to study the Bible for themselves. So he translated the Bible from Latin into German and used the new technologies of movable type and the printing press to spread his Protestant ideas. Luther's movement became an outright break with the Catholic Church and led many dissatisfied believers to form new churches of their own. The Catholic Church responded with its own reform movement, the Counter-Reformation, which revitalized the Church. Christian Europe became split, with many areas becoming Protestant and others remaining Catholic. The Renaissance also gave rise to great voyages of discovery. New advances in seafaring and map making helped Europeans explore more of the world than ever before. In 1492, Christopher Columbus began a series of expeditions from Spain that led him, and many other Europeans, to North America. These voyages led Europe to set up colonies in the Americas and establish trade routes that brought wealth to the European colonial powers. The Renaissance also gave rise to advances in science. The astronomers Copernicus and Galileo used the Renaissance idea of scientific experimentation to argue against the church's claim that Earth was the center of the universe. And Renaissance thinkers made advances in other fields, including politics. Many decades later, thinkers like Voltaire built on this foundation to create the intellectual movement called the Enlightenment. This movement celebrated human reason, promoted religious tolerance, and discouraged tyranny in government. Enlightenment thinkers believed that government should promote the rights and freedoms of people and work to solve society's problems. These ideas led colonists in North America to break from England. And establish their own nation. All these religious movements, ideas, and political and social changes helped shape the world we live in today. And they can all be traced back to the Renaissance. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. Did the shared goal of the Crusades unify the warring groups in Europe? How did medieval and Renaissance philosophies differ? We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery journey through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library.